So I want to start this unit off by taking a look at the Native American civilizations in North America. Now, you can see from the map here that for the most part, um, the North American civilizations are divided into a roughly about four different types of civilizations, um, of which there are numerous tribes spread out across the entirety of North America. So the four major societies in Native North America in the 14th, 15th century are generally grouped by region. Um, you have Eastern Woodland Societies, Southern Mound Builder Societies, Southwestern Pueblo Societies, and then the Plains Societies. Now, with the exception of the Plains Societies, these are mostly agricultural societies with domesticated plants and domesticated animals, just like you would see in Europe. Um, the main crops that these societies subsist on are beans, squash, and maize, or corn. And they become known as the Three Sisters because they grow um, not only well in unison, but each type of plant, when grown with the other, provides benefits in the soil that helps the other grow. Um, the plains societies, however, are nomadic and semi-nomadic pastoralists and hunter and gatherers. Now, again, to kind of go in the face of this idea of the noble savage that Native Americans are some sort of primitive culture just waiting to be conquered, um, you also see in North America many large-scale regional trade networks. Uh, the two largest are centered on the Mississippi River and the Gulf of Mexico. Now, like we said earlier in the video, because of the lack of domesticated animals, travel and transportation is not um, as efficient in Native America as it is in Eurasia. So mainly this deals with foot and canoe traffic. Um, there's also very complex governments, very complex social hierarchies. Um, generally in North America, women have more independence than they do in Eurasia, but still not equality. Um, they participate in government, they participate in decision making. In a few rare cases, um, there are matriarchal societies and tribes where women do hold the power. But because of the smaller nature of the societies and the less complex forms of government civilization, um, women tend to see closer to equality than you would in Eurasia. And this is no different than what we see with, say, the Mongols, um, because there is a lack of specialized labor, not a lack of it, but less specialized labor than you would see elsewhere. Um, Again, it's that all hands on deck approach where everyone must contribute in multiple ways, which gives women more power. It gives them um, more stake within the society. So first I wanna take a look at the Eastern Woodland Societies. Um, these societies are well known for what's known as longhouses. These are massive structures somewhere usually between 100, 150, 200 feet, 200 feet in length. And they usually would house up to 10 to 12 families at a time. Um, now these Eastern woodland societies mainly hunted for survival, but they also farmed uh, the three sisters. They traded very heavily in animal furs and skins, sometimes using them as currency. Now, most of the tribes in this region functioned as chiefs, um, chieftains. Um, the power in these tribes was mainly kinship based, um, but unlike in say the Mongols, the power of kinship went through their maternal lineage. So the men still held positions of power, but the positions of power that they held were determined by their relationship on their mother's side rather than on their father's. Um, now, around 1500 CE, um, a new form of government begins to develop in the eastern woodlands among what's known as the Iroquois tribes, and they unite to form what's called the Grand Council. And on this Grand Council, um, each tribe has a representative chosen by the, old, the elder women in the tribe, 
And that grand council would meet numerous times a year and in the case of emergencies to resolve disputes. And this goes directly in the face of this idea of the primitive, you know, noble savage, because this is the first form of Republican government displayed in the Americas. Um, not only that, but it is more um, inclusive and it is more representative than any government that exists in Europe or in Asia during the same time period. So this is an example of a, a uh, Iroquois longhouse. Uh, if you visit upstate New York and Pennsylvania, there's uh, numerous sites that are dedicated to, to these tribes. Now, moving south from the Eastern Woodlands, you have the, what's known as the Mound Builder Society. Um, the Mound Builder Societies make up a bunch of independent different tribes. A lot of these names will sound familiar with you. The Cherokee, the Hopewell, the Mississippian, the Chickasaw, the Seminole, all of these are Mound Builder Societies. Um, of all of the societies in North America at the time, this is by far the most agricultural and this is by far the most similar to what you would see in Europe and Asia at the time. Um, the individual tribes function as chieftains, but they're more patriarchal. Uh, because agriculture um, <clears throat> functions on such a prosperous scale for these tribes, there's able to be more specialization of labor. And as we know, with specialization of labor comes more patriarchal dominance. Um, but there's also more cultural output too. Some of these tribes like the Cherokee develop their own written language. Um, also because of the specialization of labor, the mound builder societies function and operate one of the biggest trade networks in North America. Um, with many cottage style industries, they weave cotton cloth, make jewelry out of gold and obsidian, and obviously trade in furs as well. Um, the center of this massive trade work is a city known as Cahokia, which is the basis for modern day St. Louis and was far and away the largest city in North America. Um, the Hopewell people who were the founders of Cahokia built massive earth burial mounds, um, some of these larger than many of the Egyptian pyramids. And if you travel through um, south, south and central uh, Mississippi River Valley, Arkansas, Ohio, um, Illinois, northern Georgia, Tennessee, you can see um, many of these massive burial mounds dotting the landscape. This being an example of one of those burial mounds, these sometimes would go as high as 100, 150, 200 feet um, at the very apex. Now, moving slightly west across North America, you would encounter the Plains civilizations or the Plains societies. Um, again, this is made up of many numerous independent tribes, the Kiowa, the Sioux, Comanche, Apache, Cheyenne, to name some of the more famous. Um, there was some very small scale personal farming, but within these tribes, the main source of food is migrating herds of buffalo. So these tribes are are nomadic to semi-nomadic. Um, so again, what does that mean? Well, it means very few permanent cities. Um, it means very little specialized labor, which means almost no written language. Um, but these civilizations are in no way less complex than the nomadic civilizations in Eurasia. Um, in fact, they're extremely similar. Um, the same way that the Mongols utilized every part of the horse, the plain civilizations utilize every part of the buffalo, meat for food, bone for tools, the skins for clothing and shelter. Um, in fact, they create easily movable shelters known as teepees that can be put up and taken down very quickly so that they can follow the buffalo. And these teepees are essentially the same thing that you would see in Mongolia known as yurts. So... This is an example of a plains teepee. Again, every part of the animal is used, right? The skin, the bones, every part of it goes into creating this housing. 
Now, the final civilization in North America that we want to take a look at are the Southwestern Pueblo people. Um, these consist, again, of independent tribes, but also larger civilizations. Um, the largest of these being the Anasazi, which lasted from about 500 to 12, 1200 CE. Now, uh, these people have to be incredibly ingenuous and excellent engineers in order to make it in this landscape because the land is very arid. Um, so these Pueblo people uh, master the ability to build large scale canals for irrigation and drinking water, um, which meant that they were able to accomplish large scale agriculture, but it was very weather dependent. Um, also, that irrigation water was used to make mud bricks, which were then baked in the sun to create adobe, which becomes the main building material in these civilizations. Um, the larger sieves, like the Anasazi, function similar to a European monarchy. Um, but because the agriculture in the area is so labor intensive and is so hit and miss, um, there wasn't a lot of specialized labor beyond that because so much time and so much effort had to be put into maintaining the agriculture. So these civilizations with not much specialization of labor don't produce a lot of, you know, uh, trade goods, and they're not strongly connected into those other regional trade networks. Um, so this picture is a picture of what's known as Chaco Canyon. Uh, this was for a time the largest city um, of the Anasazi and the largest city in the southwestern United States. Um, at its height, estimates are that this city would have been able to house somewhere around 50 to 60,000 people um, with many of those buildings that you see um, being sometimes three to four stories in height. Um, other Pueblo civilizations um, become known as the cliff dwellers, and uh, they are able to use um, hand tools as well as natural erosion to literally build cities into the side of cliff faces, not only for defense, but also for protection from the elements and in order to take advantage of uh, soil and water runoff. 